Današnja častna govorka Sabrina Petra Ramej je zaslužna profesorica političnih ved na Norveški univerzi za znanost in tehnologijo v Trondheimu in raziskovalna sodelovka znanstveno raziskovalnega središča v Kopru. Leta 2002 je bila izvoljena za članico Kraljevega Norveškega Združenja znanosti in umetnosti, leta 2009 pa je postala članica Norveške akademije znanosti in umetnosti. Leta 2017 je bila med nominiranci za Nobelovo nagrado za mir in sicer za dolgoletno delo na področju vrednot, ki promovirajo vladavino prava, toleranco, aktivno participacijo in varstvo manjšinskih pravic. Njena akademska pot je impresivna. Diplomirala je iz filozofije na Univerzi Stanford, magistrirala iz mednarodnih odnosov na Univerzi v Arkansaju, medtem ko je aktivno služila v ameriškem vojnem letalstvu, doktorat iz politologije pa je pridobila na Univerzi Kalifornije v Los Angelesu. Čeprav formalno ni zgodovinarka, pogosto objavlja dela, ki temeljijo na zgodovinskih in socioloških raziskavah. Njeno strokovno področje obsega vzhodno in jugovzhodno Evropo, pri čemer se osredotoča na religijo, politiko in politično filozofijo. Ukvarja se tudi s pomenom glasbe in njenim vplivom na ljudi. Je avtorica 16 znanstvenih monografij in urednica 40 zbornikov, kar jo umešča med vodilne avtorje na področju družboslovja. Hkrat je tudi ena izmed najbolj priljubljenih avtoric. Njena široko zastavljena raziskava o vzhodni Evropi Whose Democracy, Nationalism, Religion and the Doctrine of Collective Rights in Post-1989 Eastern Europe je bila leta 1997 razglašena za najboljšo akademsko knjigo po izboru revije Choice, ki jo izdaja Združenje univerzitetnih in raziskovalnih knjižnic in je merilnik najbolj vplivnih znanstvenih objav. V zadnjih letih je posegla tudi na področje književnosti in objavlja zlasti humorne spise in pesmi. Njena dela so prevedena v več evropskih jezikov, a žal še ne v slovenščino. Kljub temu je Sabrina Ramej dobro poznana v Sloveniji, kjer sodeluje z oglednimi znanstveniki, kot so Danica Fink-Hafner, Egon Pelikan, Roman Kuhar, Božo Repe in številni drugi. Objavljala je tudi v reviji Teorija in praksa, večkrat je svoje poglede delila v intervjujih, publikaciji z največjo naklado. Veseli nas, da bo na letošnjem retrofestu s predavanjem Sanjanje po vojnih san, upanje in neuspehi komunizma otvorila dogodek. Sledila bo moderirana diskusija, ki jo bo vodil sociolog prof. dr. Roman Kuhar z Filozofske fakultete Univerze v Ljubljani. Ms. Ramej, the stage is yours. President Kučan, Mej Jankovič, dekanus Zorica, my dear friend Bozo Repe, other friends here, colleagues, and maybe some soon-to-be friends. I see several old faces. I had a conference on Slovenia back in 1983 in Trondheim, and among those who came were Bozo, and Mitya, uh, Alesh, uh, you, I don't think you were, were you on hand for, yes, you were also, Roman was also there for the, Roman came to, to Trondheim twice. Uh, this is, as uh, uh, Bojo might know, the 15th time I come to Slovenia. Uh, twice were touristic, most of the time professional. Once in the 90s I came up here with my partner Chris Hessenstab, uh and it was a, a dining tour. We just got together with friends uh, for, I guess, four nights and just had a nice time. Uh, and that was the extent of it. Uh, on this trip, I looking forward to seeing friends again, and as I told Bozo to do a little bit of Christmas shopping along the way. Very important to you know, I have opportunity here to come and buy Slovenian things for people in Norway, fantastic. Uh, by the way, I have a bad habit of slipping in and out of different accents, sorry about that. It's the way I am. I was born this way, uh, and it, or maybe not. Uh, at any rate, uh, but my father did the same thing, so I'm probably born this way. Uh, the, the lecture today is drawn from my book, East Central Europe uh, and Communism, uh, subtitled Politics, Culture and Society, 1943 
to 1991. Uh, not everybody uses the term East Central Europe the way I do, but I use it interchangeably with Eastern Europe. So for me, Albania, for example, uh, obviously ex-Yugoslavia, uh, Bulgaria, these are all part of uh, East Central Europe as far as I'm concerned. I can mean what I mean by the words I use. Hmm? Now, uh, as we all know, uh, when the war came to an end, uh, World War II, that war, um, usually when I say the war, I mean the one of 1991 to 95. But when, when the Second World War came to an end, uh, as you all know, uh, communists came into power, but there were, of course, uh, kings in place in Bulgaria and, and Romania for a couple of years. There were coalitions for a while, a very shaky one in Hungary, even shakier in Poland. But then the, the communists were believers, and what they wanted was a wonderland of social justice. Uh, they wanted economic prosperity, social equality. They wanted life, the dreamers, not all of them were dreamers, of course, but those who were dreamers wanted things to be wonderful, uh, to be glorious. Uh, and they had some ideas how, how to get there. Um, now, from the standpoint of the dreamers, you know, they're always opportunists, and I'm not interested in the opportunists here, uh, but for the dreamers, uh, the, the thinking was that they knew uh, how to work for people as a whole, uh, to make things really good for the society. Uh, but there were other political parties who didn't share their vision. So if the communists were in favor of people, I'm putting it in really simple terms, but it, it really comes down to a very simple formula. If the communists were in favor of people and other political parties had other agendas, then they were not working for the people, straightforward. Uh, so this, of course, meant that uh, the idea of suppressing uh, these, let's say, bad, in a view of the communists, uh, political parties made some sense. Again, you know, we always have to distinguish between the idealists, the dreamers, and the opportunists. Uh, and in every every country, there are also some bad people along the way, like in the United States. We've got Trump now. We have to hope we can keep him out of power and put him in prison where he belongs. Um, oh, sorry about that aside. Th these things happen, you know. I was born this way. Uh, okay, uh, the communists now... Um, uh, had their agenda, and the, the, the ideal thing was to put in, in prison people who were, let's say, going to stand in their way. Among the people who went into prison uh, early on were Catholic Bishop Peter Chule of Mostar and the Orthodox Metropolitan Arsenia Bradvarovich of the Montenegro Literal. Uh, so uh, bishops were put in prison. Uh, um, but uh, not only here, as you know. Now, um, and we get back to that. Now, if the communists had a plan, they wanted to make things really good, uh, then uh, some things followed from this. Randomness, things just happening, that's not good. Free association, just any, any, any people meeting with anybody they like, doing whatever they wanted, that's problematic. Uh, freedom of public speech, hmm, what if they say bad things? Of course, people say bad things all the time. So these things could be dangerous. So uh, uh, those things needed to be regulated from the communist point of view. And then, of course, uh, there was the idea that uh, there should be planning. Uh, planning not just economics, but politics, culture, social life. Everything was going to be planned and controlled. So. Uh, in this connection, of course, you had the organizational monopoly. So, for example, the Boy Scouts, uh, which is an international organization, the Girl Scouts uh, uh, couldn't function in, in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, certainly not in the early post-war years, uh, and, and not in, 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 in the, in the post-war period up through 1989 or, or longer. Um, now, I, I decided to start the narrative of my book with the second session of Avnoi, in November 1943, because it seemed like an absolutely logical place to start it. Uh, that's when the, the communist system was being put together here. And of course, in, in, in Poland, it was put together in, in Lublin the following year. Uh, and ended with, uh, in, in 1991, there were three things in 1991, uh, what you all think of immediately is the Yugoslav meltdown. Uh, but in fact, in Bulgaria and Albania, uh, in 1991, it was the first time that you had elections uh, uh, where the communists were voted out of power. So they were actually uh, in power until 1991. Uh, and, you know, there, there are people in, in, let's say, the United States, even people thinking about Eastern Europe, who say, ah, oh, 1989, that's it. Well, it wasn't really that's it. That's it for the northern tier. 
Okay. Now, uh, in turning to my work, I read or reread some books. Uh, I, I, I wanted to look at books covering the post-war period. Uh, altogether, I read five books or reread, read or reread five books covering the period from 1945 up to the time of publication. Uh, I read one book uh, covering from 1970 to 2000. Uh, and then I read additional books uh, uh, covering just the communist era. And I started yet another book. Uh, there was only one book I threw away. There were two really bad books, but one was so bad that it went straight to the trash can without by even finishing it. It was a very, very bad book. Uh, I don't like to talk about uh, authors who I think write dribble. I, I like to, to, I prefer to write about those people who've done great, I mentioned those people who've done great things. And I'd like to, to I'm gonna highlight five people. Uh, two absolutely outstanding books on uh, the communist era in Eastern Europe. The first that I will mention is by Ivan Berend. Uh, it was commissioned by Cambridge University Press as part of uh, uh, the series on economic history. Because of that, uh, it is focused on economics. It's a brilliant book. I think Step Peanuts is mentioned, if I remember correctly, along the way, but there's not much on religion. It's a book about economics. Brilliant book. Uh, the other one, and I dare say that some of you will surely have read this book, uh, is by François Feto. I hope I've got the pronunciation right. I don't speak French. Um, he wrote a book, uh, translated, it was published in French in 1969, it came out in, uh, in English uh, with Penguin in, in 1974. Uh, this is, is a, a, a lovely book. Uh, it, it might be my single favorite book uh, uh, among the, the, these various books by the people that I read. It, it's just a wonderful book. But of course it, it was published uh, 50 years ago uh, and it couldn't tell the whole story. There are three additional books worth mentioning. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski's book, The Soviet Bloc, came out in its second edition in 1967. Uh, Teresa Grakowska Harmstone uh, put together an edited volume published by Indiana on uh, communism in Eastern Europe, that was the title. Uh, those two books I actually assigned in my classes when I, I, I was first teaching. And then a third book, uh, which was uh, edited by P Peter Toma, who was teaching at Arizona, University of Arizona, The Changing Face of, uh, of Communism, and published, in fact, by University of Arizona Press in 1970. These are worthy books, uh, have uh, very reliable <coughs> I just took a super cough mixture before coming in here. That's supposed to kill off all coughing. I don't know, but I'm not infectious. Nobody will get sick from me. No, I promise. No, no, no. Okay, now, um, uh, the, the communists, uh, the, 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 and these, these books were, were mainly about politics. Uh, really discuss, and, and Brzezinski's book is all, all politics, and Rakowska Harmstone's book, uh, as I recall, likewise. But the, the communists were also concerned about other things. They were concerned, of course, about socialization, uh, about education, uh, but they were also concerned about religion, about culture, uh, about gender equality, uh, and uh, I had originally proposed to cover all three of those topics in my lecture today, uh, but uh, there wasn't time as I budgeted it for gender equality. Uh, so I, I will talk about religion, culture, and uh, in fact music, uh, and uh, then uh, economics. Economics is unavoidable in talking about what happened with communism. It's absolutely unavoidable. Okay. Um, so looking over these 16 books uh, that I either read or reread, uh, so five covering the entire, I've, I've, I've sort of gone over that. Um, only my edited collection had much to say about gender equality and culture, and the rest largely, largely ignored it. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not entirely sure why, because the authors uh, would have known from their reading that the communists were very concerned about, uh, for example, the music of Arnold Schoenberg. How many of you here like the music of Arnold Schoenberg? I see nobody likes it. Uh, how many of you hate the music of Arnold Schoenberg? Oh, the Blazek. How many of you know the music of Arnold Schoenberg? <laughs> two of you, two of us. <laughs> uh, meet yeah, We can talk about Schoenberg later. I will tell you what I think of him, but it'll be in private. Uh, okay. Uh, so. Uh, 
what, what we, you know, communism, we, ah, communism, yeah, a typical communist country. What was a typical communist country like? I will tell you. Mm. Okay. K typical communist country, you'd have collective farming. Let's see, Yugoslavia didn't have that. And Poland, uh, it, uh, it, it went away in 1956. So those two were not typical communist countries. All right. Typical communist country would also be a member of Comic Con and, and active in the Warsaw Pact. Let's see, that rules out Albania you know, and Romania. Those are not typical communist countries. Uh, a, a typical communist country would not be uh, uh, allowing a Catholic university to operate, uh, that's in Lublin, uh, uh, or uh, to pay the salaries of uh, professors of theology, uh, and that latter rules out East Germany. Uh, a typical communist country would not have uh, these little uh, uh, sister parties, you know, like the Christian Democrats or uh, the United Peasant Party or whatnot. And that rules out several countries, uh, Hungary, Poland, and also Czechoslovakia. Uh, uh, oh, not, not Hungary, I'm sorry. Uh, didn't rule out Hungary. It ruled out uh, uh, East Germany. Uh, Poland and Czechoslovakia. Uh, so what we're left with is there was only one typical communist country, Hungary. But it wasn't typical of, of communism. It wasn't typical of the area. Hungary was t typical of itself. <laughs> Will that work for you? <laughs> Works for me. Uh, okay. There's a, a German scholar called Jürgen Kotzka, and he wrote a book uh, some time ago uh, to talk about what was communism about. And I liked his description, uh, his, his terminology, because we, you know, people worried, can we say totalitarianism? Is that kind of not, not a good word? But is, 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 uh, can we put everything in the path of authoritarian? Uh, what what uh, can we do? And Kotzka came up with the term thoroughly penetrated societies. Uh, and this makes a great deal of sense to me. I will tell you, I, 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 in, in Leipzig, I ended up, uh, this is 1988, so uh, it was still under the SED, uh, and I ended up in a cafe and I somehow ended up sitting down with uh, three local East Germans. And I told them that I had a, a little stammtisch back in Seattle. I was working in Seattle in those days. And we would get together every week uh, and just talk in German. And they said, uh, this, and they said the same people every week. I said, yes. And they said, we couldn't do that here in, in, in Leipzig because the communists would want a, a membership list. <laughs> we didn't have members. <laughs> Not as, we had friends getting together, but one of the membership list, and they would want to know in, in, in advance what topics we planned to discuss. <laughs> we didn't have any idea. We would just meet. So, you know, but this told me that, you know, that, that, that this is a way which, in which uh, the East, East German uh, society was, in fact, uh, penetrated. Uh, and, of course, one could get in trouble with, uh, there, there was a poet, uh, there were two of them, two young poets in Albania. That's his Nichtim text. Uh, there, were, there, were, there were two young poets in, uh, in Albania, and they wrote some little poems that uh, I think most of us wouldn't make anything of one way or the other. Uh, Hoche was a reader. He read, all, he read Balzac in the original French. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, he read these poems. He said, these poems are no good. I had them executed. Huh? For writing a couple of poems, executed. Poof. That's certainly a thoroughly uh, penetrated society. Obviously, there are degrees of penetration. Um, and then, of course, there's a the question of music. If if one has music that is highly dissonant, for example, oh, comics get really nervous. What, what, what's going on? What's meant by that? Oh, oh, uh, I'm afraid already. Huh? Why can't we have something like da da dee dee, pock, 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 pock. By the way, that, that is the greatest piece of music ever written. If, if anybody asks you what's the greatest piece of music ever written, you tell them it's the Blue Danube by the great Johann Strauss Jr. Mm, yes, that is the correct answer to that question. Now you know. Okay. Um, it's good to know things, you know. Very good to know things. Uh, if you want to know what the second best piece of music is, uh, that's in fact also by Johann Strauss Jr. That's Wiener Blut. Uh, which I hope some of you know. Uh, the, uh, uh, 
the chief tools of control that the, the communists had, of course, control of education, you have to have that, control of elections, control of the judiciary, control of the press, they would rewrite the constitution. Let's see, Victor Orban did that recently, didn't he? Mm. Uh, and uh, demonization, imprisonment, and uh, expulsion of the opposition. Uh, but what's, what's this about control? Why did the communists want control? They didn't, it wasn't just for the sake of control. It wasn't just so that they could have nice jobs and, and a good income and fancy, fancy cars with chauffeurs. The point of it was a control to transform society. They had an idea, huh? an idea for an alternative modernity, uh, or as I, call, as I told you, a kind of a wonderland of equality and social justice. This is the dream. Uh, and as I told you, not all of them were on board with that, but uh, some were. As I told you, I'm going to discuss three spheres, religion relatively quickly, uh, uh, orchestral music uh, with love, uh, 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 and I think I can tell you that uh, every composer I will mention, I've found and, and listened to at least a little bit, some of uh, composers I've known my, my, my whole thinking life, let's say, uh, but uh, uh, some of them I discovered along the way. That doesn't mean I can sing all the tunes, but uh, you don't want me to do that anyway. Okay. Um, bishops. Now, the, one of the problems with, with uh, religion, uh, if one wants to control uh, uh, the, uh, people's thoughts, and communists wanted to shape, certainly shape people's thoughts, you've all heard the expression, the new communist man, the new communist woman, or new Soviet man, new Soviet woman, uh, one had to, in essence, uh, be able to establish that the communist party was the, the final authority. What about God? Oh, that's a problem. Let's put God in prison. That'll teach him. Oh, we can't do that. Uh, God's not visible. Um, well, I don't know. There might be some people who say they've seen God. I haven't. Uh, uh, most of us haven't, fortunately, uh, uh, because that might be a sign of something. Uh, but uh, putting God in prison is not an option, even if one could see God. Uh, so, but one could put bishops in prison. Where were bishops put in prison? Let's see. In Poland. Bishops are archbishops and cardinals. Uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Yugoslavia, and Albania. Everywhere except East Germany. They put him in prison. Uh, in Romania, there was a, a, it was decided that there could be a canal built to link the Danube with uh, the Black Sea. Something's called the Danube Tisa Canal Project, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, there was a 450 person, 450 man brigade set up to work this. It was all Catholic priests. Uh, about half of them died on, died uh, at, at the workplace. The Greek Rite Catholic Church was suppressed in Czechoslovakia and Romania, but came back in, in Czechoslovakia in 1968. Okay, repression didn't work so well. Uh, in Poland, for example, Gomułka, when he came into office, he wanted to have some support and assistance from Wyszynski. So uh, he opposed Wyszynski, said, uh, I want to let you out, you work with me. And Wyszynski said, yeah, 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 but I want my bi uh, bishops that you've got in prison too let out. So go, 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 go. Oh, I twist my arm. Uh, and so, you know, this was already one thing. Minzenti uh, in, in Hungary during the revolution of 56 fled to the American embassy, later was allowed to leave, much later. Uh, Cardinal Beran in Czechoslovakia was allowed to leave the country. Uh, and uh, Cardinal Aloysius de Peanuts uh, in Croatia, he was released from detention at the end of 1951, but told he had to stay in his native village. Uh, the uh, uh, 1980 uh, was, of course, marked a major watershed in Yugoslavia. It was also a watershed in Poland and throughout the air area, the region, because in 1980 you had, of course, Tito passing away in May, but in some you had the appearance of the uh, in independent trade union Solidarity. Uh, in 1982, I, I came uh, to back to this part of the world uh, visiting uh, three cities, uh, Belgrade, uh, in, in the order in which I visited them. First I went to Belgrade, then to Zagreb, and then came here to Ljubljana. Uh, and uh, I, I remember very much as uh, uh, Dusan Drago Savac, I think it was, who liked to say, Svaki nationalism je opasan. 
To which I say, well, it, it depends how you define nationalism, doesn't it? I mean, I could define it in such a way uh, that uh, nationalism, maybe nationalism will be dangerous. Or I could define it in, in, in a way, you know, where I say, well, you know, nationalism just means that you d dance your country's dances. Well, I don't know if that's all, but no, most people don't use it quite that way. Um, my head's full of music. Uh, 1982, I, I, I talked to people at, at the Srpska Patriarchia, and uh, one of the people there uh, uh, told me about uh, an appeal that he'd uh, helped to organize. I don't think he was the main organizer, but he was one of, one of the people who organized and signed an appeal for the protection of the Serbian people in Kosovo and their holy shrines. And uh, he was very proud of this, and he said uh, it was in this connection that he said nationalism is good, because nationalism for him meant standing up for one's people, in his case, for the Serbian people. In, uh, in, the, in the area, the, 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 the religious sphere, what, what, what the communists forgot, though, uh, was that uh, repression, uh, oh, uh, and where's Roman? Uh, I need the slide number one in any, any point. Uh, so what, what they forgot is that repression can work, but it has to be pretty total. If we think back to Roman times, uh, before Constantine, uh, you had the Olympian religion, and that's, of course, with uh, uh, Jupiter, Juno, uh, Mercury, uh, and all the rest, uh, Minerva. Um, there are 14 main deities in, in the Olympian religion, and this was stamped out. Uh, there have been some attempts to revive it. There's some polyth small polytheist religion in Norway, but I, I don't think they're using the Olympian religion. Uh, I'm not a member. No. Just you make a note. I'm not a member. Um, so. Uh, and then there was also something called the Cult of Mithra, or sometimes written Mithras with an S at the end. Uh, this was a, a, a very uh, patriarchal, super patriarchal religion. Uh, compared to that, uh, there's no patriarchy in, 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 in uh, Christianity. It was very, I mean, they, they would make sure that the men and the women didn't come to services together. So it was very, 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 I mean, not even the same, you know, in some Christian churches, they put the women on one side, the men on the other. They didn't even have that. Just, you know, we want service for the men or service for the women. These things got stamped out because there was enough repression brought to bear uh, by the Roman, uh, Roman emperors. Uh, and this is how it went out. But in the absence of that kind of repression, uh, if it's not that, that much, then, of course, it doesn't work so well. And uh, what you see here behind is, uh, uh, is a comparison. You've got also the, OK, good, uh, a comparison of the, um, I bet was for guessing. Uh, I, I actually need, need my other bag, I'm sorry. Um, because I have the tables in there. Forgot to bring them up. Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much. Um, what? What? Thank you. Uh, what you can see with uh, is that the countries which were under communism, uh, you have very high ra rates of of religiosity. In uh, this is a belief in God. It's it's not about this is not attendance at church. It's about belief in God. And in Georgia, 99% of people uh, believe in, in God. Uh, and Bosnia-Herzegovina, 94, Serbia, 87. Uh, somehow I don't have Slovenia here. We can maybe, with your help, get it in later. Um, uh, and uh, the, the lowest is uh, uh, Czechia, or Czech Republic. Uh, and this is, uh, I, I believe, and I think this is kind of a, a scholarly consensus, that, that this has a lot to do with uh, the Thirty Years' War, the smashing of, of, uh, of the Protestants, uh, and the establishment of a Habsburg uh, Habsburg imposed uh, Catholicism. It was sort of to, to resent the Habsburgs was also to resent Catholicism. And then we look at the uh, at the other side of things, and we see here that you have the uh, uh, the highest religiosity is in, in Germany, and the lowest in that set is in Norway, where I live. Uh, Norway until very recently had uh, a state church. 
and I think that's one of the things that pushed it down. Uh, this has been altered a bit. Uh, if anybody's interested in it, if there's a question and answer, I can tell you what I know about the present situation there. So what we, can we say about the communist religious policy? Well, if the policy, if the idea was to increase religiosity, then the communists succeeded brilliantly, but that was not their idea. So we would say the communist religious policy failed to obtain, uh, attain its objectives. Uh, music, much the same pattern, uh, and uh, what we see here is that the communist efforts to control uh, and I'm interested for the purposes of the lecture today on orchestral music, or m maybe to some extent chamber music. Um, and the communists encountered resistance, sabotage, and outright mockery. And what did the, 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 the communists in the bloc want? The bloc is, of course, uh, the six countries, uh, obviously not Yugoslavia, obviously not Albania. Um, uh, what they wanted was socialist realism, although Hocha liked socialist realism too. This is a fine thing, very good. You know what you get? It's all nice, everything pretty, joyful, hurrah, woo! And that's uh, uh, not really a good version of socialist realism, uh, but it, it captures some aspect of it. Uh, socialist realism was a doctrine which held that uh, music, orchestral music for our purposes, paintings, uh, architecture, films, uh, did I mention fiction? Fiction needed to uplift people, needed to portray capitalists as wicked and exploitative, needed to portray the communists as heroes uh, and incredibly good people, uh, and uh, to just inspire people. And uh, music was supposed to be joyful. And one of the things, one of the rules, which this actually came from Stalin, ultimately. Yes. Um, Put it here. Here. Okay. <laughs> That's even worse. <laughs> As we'd say in the old country, name a problema. Um, uh, Stalin believed that if, um, if music could not be hummed, it was no good. But you see, uh, Blue Danny was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, music good. Uh, what about Schoenberg? Ha! You listen to some Schoenberg, see if you can hum it afterwards. If you want to really take on a big challenge, try humming Pierre Lunaire. Um, I've listened to it twice, um, <clears throat> years apart. 1948, the Soviets convened a congress in uh, Prague uh, with composers and musicologists and told them that they should renounce extreme subjectivism. I would take that to mean renounce individuality. Uh, don't express some original ideas. Uh, don't come up with some new new ideas of your own. Follow the true, the, the, the proven path. We know that socialist realism is good, just try to keep replicating that. Well, you know, you could pretty much predict how this went. There were mediocre composers who were perfectly happy to do this because they would get bonuses uh, in, in pay, they would get contracts, they would get all kinds of things uh, coming with with this uh, if, if as rewards for just churning out what the party wanted. People who were, uh, let's say, more alive mentally didn't want to do that. Uh, and of course, uh, there were uh, repercussions. Clement Gottwald uh, from Czechoslovakia, head of the Communist Party there, said he would use an iron broom to sweep out all the heritage of the past. It's no, no good, get rid of it, including jazz. He didn't like jazz. And uh, he said that all uh, the, I'm sorry, the League of Czechoslovak communists said that all music composed in Czechoslovakia had to be joyful and melodious, as I've already told you. Okay, there were four very prominent composers in Poland at the end of the war, uh, orchestral composers. Uh, the first of these, Andrzej Panufnik, uh, he's written a, a book, Autumn something or other, a, a nocturne, beautiful music, incredibly beautiful. Uh, 
He didn't want to stay in Poland with the communist setting socialist realism. He packed his bags and moved to England. Uh, Roman Palesta, uh, uh, he was sent into exile for refusing to follow the guidelines of socialist realism. But there were two very prominent composers uh, who's, who stayed. Uh, uh, one was Witold Lutosławski. And uh, Lutosławski uh, Luto, Luto did compose some things in a socialist realist uh, mode. But he decided quite early on that he was going to do children's music. Uh, and uh, the children's music was uh, very well received. He also wrote some pop music that made it onto the charts. And then you have Shistov Penderecki. Uh, you might have heard uh, some of his music. Uh, he had a threnody for the victims of Hiroshima. Uh, just a, a searing piece of music. Uh, uh, not hummable. Uh, that came out in 1960, but it really shook the, the orchestral, the, the, the concert world. Pfft. Who is this Penderecki? Uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, but not before coming to Trondheim, where he, he led, an, led the orchestra in, in his own work, and I had the great privilege to hear Penderecki uh, composing his own work. 1949 was a glorious year. Not for the reason you're thinking. Uh, <laughs> it was the 100th anniversary of Frederick Chopin's birthday, and uh, he was, of course, going to be commemorated and celebrated, uh, and uh, among others, he composed some waltzes, he composed uh, polonaise, he composed a funeral march that we all know. Um, and uh, Bierut, uh, head of the Communist Party there, Boleslav Bierut, said that uh, said that Chopin had been a prophet, announcing the arrival of communism and socialism, socialism and communism. Uh, so uh, this was his take on it. Uh, where should composers get their in inspiration? Bierut had an idea for that too. He, he said that composers should get their inspiration from factory workers and peasants. Uh, and uh, in turn, uh, the, the music should be readily understandable uh, by factory workers and peasants. I will tell you this, you know, I, I started listening to uh, orchestral music when, in a serious way, I'd heard some before. Johann Strauss I knew from like probably age six or something, uh, but I think I was about 15, 14, or 15, maybe, let's go with age 15, that I started listening and, and, and buying records. And the first time I listened to Dvořák's uh, New World Symphony, uh, I could sort of understand the scherzo, and the rest was beyond me, like, what's going on here? Uh, and from this I understood that that music is, is like a language and one has to become one has to learn uh, in essence the language of music and the more one the better one learns it the better one can appreciate it and, and over time I came to love the entire symphony okay but but oh no oh, a tonal music 12 tone it's not me groaning I'm, 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 I'm you know uh, channeling the, the communists of, of that day, because they disliked this stuff. There was a so-called Vienna School. This consisted of Arno Schoenberg, well-loved by Mitya. You already confessed that, didn't you? Um, <laughs> Alban Berg uh, and uh, Anton Webern. Uh, and these three uh, were dealing with uh, the, the twelve-tone rows. So you lay out the, the notes, and then you've got to use every one um, once. This is the theory, before you repeat. So uh, things like uh, the Blue Danube couldn't be written because uh, with that system, one gets other things. And the communists despised that, absolutely despised it. You can't, if you can't hum it, it's no good, um, according to uh, Stalin's thinking. Hungary, the music of Bela Bartok was initially banned. I mean, even now, I think he's probably still uh, the best known Hungarian uh, orchestral composer. Uh, and he was banned because they thought his music reflected the influence of Schoenberg and Stravinsky. Now, uh, I don't know, uh, how many of you know uh, Shostakovich's Leningrad Symphony? Okay. 
And how many of you know where he got the theme? Where did he get the theme? Mitya, where did he get the theme? <laughs> he got it from, from Franz Lehar. Uh, who wrote a waltz? And then with Sasako, uh, so he turned it into a, into a vicious march. But then Bartok came along and wrote a concerto for orchestra. Uh, and if if you listen to that. It's a very explicit, unmistakable mockery of that movement of, uh, of uh, Shostakovich. When I, I first heard that, I thought, what? what's going on here? How, what, 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 mockery, a mockery of another composer's work? But that's what, that's what he did. So there you go. Um, now, Bartok, uh, uh, Bartok uh, uh, had uh, b passed away in 1945, uh, so he wasn't uh, facing this issue of uh, socialist realism. But there was a, a composer called Indre Shervansky. He wrote the Seven Eight for Strings in 1951, and he. Uh, Followed the, the followed the doctrine, got a prize, a shoot prize, and uh, he did it again. So he got another prize, and then he wanted to uh, to do something else. So he brought out six orchestral uh, pieces, and that was not loved because he was pushing into into realms that were sort of twelve tonish, uh, eight tonalish, uh, and that was not welcomed. Novels and painters were also supposed to praise socialism uh, and works which were not doing this, such as uh, you know, foreign works, you know, like Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, Aldous Huxley's book, H.G. Wells. Uh, these were banned. They were remo removed from libraries. In Yugoslavia, um, socialist realism never got off the ground. There was a, 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 a faint start that, that, to do that in 1949 when there was an effort, uh, an announcement that there was going to be an exhibition in Belgrade to showcase the works of uh, works inspired by socialist realism. Many of the works on display there had nothing to do with socialist realism at all. Uh, then there was an effort to make a second exhibition in uh, in uh, Croatia later that year, uh, and uh, hardliners got involved with that and managed to suppress, uh, as in keep from uh, being displayed, about three quarters of the works which are submitted. But then in 1952, the renowned uh, Croatian novelist, uh, Miroslav Krleža, he presented a lecture to the Congress of Yugoslav Writers attacking uh, the doctrine of socialist realism. How could he do that? Well, he talked with Tito and Gilas beforehand, said, I want to do this. And they said, please do so. So it was cleared in advance, and this was a clear watershed, because once he came out with that attack uh, from Kerleja, uh, people knew that there was, uh, th this was not uh, a doctrine that was enforced there. Uh, Possibly Yugoslavia's most important composer in the decades after the Second World War uh, was Ljubica Maric. And she composed works marked by, get this, 12 tone and quarter tone elements. Uh, I listened to some of this. I'm not sure if I heard the quarter tone, but uh, uh, this is again, this is not music the hum, but it's music which was highly valued. In Poland, there was some relaxation after October 56. Uh, a, a, composed, uh, a, a symphony composed by Luto Swapski earlier, which had been banned, could now be played. Uh, Penderecki, who was 20 years younger than uh, Luto Swapski, uh, in 1980 composed a piece called La Crimosa. Uh, and this was in uh, uh, to honor uh, the uh, tenth uh, mark the tenth anniversary of the suppression of uh, of the protests about meat prices because that was in December of 1970. He later turned that into a Polish requiem, expanding it. His work reflects the, in, uh, the influence of Pierre Boulez, uh, Karl Heinz Stockhausen, Janis Zanakis, and John Cage. And I had the great privilege of seeing John Cage performing in Seattle 
in a, a cathedral where instrumentalists were spread all over the place. One here, one there, one in the loft. Uh, he was uh, he was there on a, a keyboard. It was a uh, synthesizer. It's a long time ago. Henrik Goretzky. How many of you know Henrik Goretzky's music? Mitya. Oh, come on, you're letting me down. Um, uh, Goretzky uh, is best known today for his third symphony. Uh, this was picked up by, uh, there was a recording made on, I think it was Nonsuch Records. It was picked up by a pop music station and played. And it became a hit. All of a sudden, people who didn't listen to concert music were, were really enjoying Goretzky. Uh, I, li I re-listened to it for maybe the fifth time uh, not that long ago, and again, it's very moving. It's, one, one of the, it's a three-movement symphony. One of the movements is very moving, uh, and uh, uh, even if you, if you don't like to be moved, you won't like it. <laughs> East Germany. Uh, there are uh, two um, very prominent composers, um, Karl, uh, uh, Heinz, Heinz Eisler, and uh, Carl Dessau. Uh, Eisler spent some years in Hollywood writing film music, uh, but then uh, ended up after the war in, uh, in, in East Germany, uh, initially the Soviet occupied, occupied zone. When East Germany was, uh, the German Democratic Republic was proclaimed, uh, an anthem, uh, national anthem was needed, and he provided the music. Uh, but I tell you a secret, huh? Uh, some of the themes for the national anthem he took from one of the film scores he'd done back in Hollywood. Don't tell anybody. Um, Paul Dessau, uh, the other uh, prominent composer, he wrote an opera called The Trial of Lucullus, uh, and uh, this had some features in the music that the authorities didn't like, and he had to redo it and, and submit it for approval. Uh, this is, of course, uh, again, a sign of the importance with which the importance that the uh, communists invested in music. Uh, the most serious taboo in GDR, German Democratic Republic, music policy was uh, that Schoenberg should be understood to be bad. Hans Eisler, this great composer, uh, and I would say great, yes, uh, in December 1954 presented a lecture uh, at a very prominent uh, location in, uh, in Berlin in which he praised the work of Arnold Schoenberg. He said that he was the greatest uh, concert uh, orchestral composer of the 20th century. He was not punished. I mean, I couldn't punish Eisler. You know, he was beyond that. His, his, you know, the most famous East German composer, world renowned. Uh, but there was a, a professor, Karl Laux, at the Dresden Academy of Music, who offered the statement that. Uh, uh, that uh, Eisler's defense of Schoenberg was no less than a catastrophe. Uh, catastrophe, huh? How much time do we have? We need to... We, we passed, I guess. <laughs> so. There were controversies about Wagner in East Germany. We're not going to discuss that. Uh, in Yugoslavia, there were in some, just briefly, about the rock bands uh, from standpoint of the authorities. There were problematic bands like Leibach. Uh, there were uh, friendly bands uh, like, well, some of the stuff sung by Indexy uh, and politically irrelevant bands like uh, Tsevena Yubaka, Yabuka, sorry, uh, and uh, Plavi Orchestra. Uh, ordinary people divided things in a different way. That's not good theory here, you know. <laughs> That's Plavi Orchestra. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You don't think it's politically relevant? <laughs> it was relevant? Yeah. I don't think it was relevant. Come on. <laughs> he was the, the, the uh, what was his name? Losic was his, the head of the band. He's the only rock musician who flat out refused to see me. I don't know why. He just flat out refused. Uh, most of them were happy to talk to me, and it was very interesting in, in, in my experience. So how, how we say the communists did our music? Well, let's see. Uh, socialist, realist music died. Uh, the uh, 
Concert music didn't make much difference to how people were thinking. Uh, the Vienna School and uh, the, uh, the Western music couldn't be blocked out. Uh, and the uh, music of Ka John Cage, Karl Heinz Stockhausen and others did influence things. Uh, you know, I timed this, but then I always improvise. Uh, okay, so um, let's talk economics. Uh, so we're going to need uh, slide number two uh, very soon. At this point, you're going to be busy, Roman. Uh, so um, things didn't necessarily go so so well in economics. Uh, as you can see on slide two, uh, the uh, after the war, when of course there was a lot of rebuilding to be done, the, the uh, rates of uh, of uh, oh, it's not that's not slide two. Sorry, uh, but I can tell you that the rates of industrial growth uh, were between 22 and 29 percent, uh, and but gradually slowed down. Um, but uh, then uh, by 1979, uh, the uh, there's a, quite a bit slowed down, and one of the problems is, is now shown in, in slide number two, which is the growth of imports, uh, because uh, this is a percentage growth, uh, annual gro rates of growth. So it, it, this is a phenomenal and, and a phenomenal growth, uh, and of course it allowed these countries to to live very nicely in the short run. Uh, it more or less as if you took out uh, three credit cards and then just went wild uh, for a month, and then then what after that? And that's that's precisely the situation they felt they faced. Um, I'll tell you about three key, key uh, f events that contributed to this result. The first was the June 1953 uh, protest across East Germany. Uh, the second was uh, the uh, protest in uh, the, the Hungarian Revolution, and the third was the, the meat price protest in Poland in 1970. And what Hanukkah and Gerek especially, but also uh, also uh, other communist leaders learned from this was that uh, if they wanted to maintain control, not make the country democratic. And they couldn't do that as long as the Soviets were imposing hegemony. Um, they had to, to give people a better life. And it had to be getting steadily better. Uh, so the upshot was that, for example, in East Germany, um, public transportation was heavily subsidized. Food, basic foods were subsidized. Clothing was subsidized, uh, medical care was subsidized, rents were subsidized, uh, concert uh, tickets were subsidized, uh, and if I've forgotten anything to mention anything, it was probably subsidized as well. Uh, so the upshot was that uh, the East German government and, and the others were doing similar things too, uh, were spending themselves into the hole. Uh, there was a man in, in, in Germany called Gerhard Schürer. We call him bald to end there. Bald, no warten. Gerhard Schürer uh, was the chair of the State Planning Commission from 1966 to 89. He repeatedly came to Honecker and said, we can't continue like this. This is no good. Uh, we're spending too much. We're not making enough money from exports. Uh, and uh, East German merchandise was not, not well, uh, certainly the, the, the electronics were not competitive in, the, in Western Europe or North America, competitive within the, the communist zone, but not, not outside. And so um, Honecker ignored it. He, he didn't want to consider this. And then uh, finally, uh, in October 1989, which, as you know, was like on the eve of the crash, uh, Shearer uh, told Honecker that just to keep the debt from rising, there would have to be such a belt tightening that the people would, would be up in arms. Slide number five, please. I've forgotten what's on it, though. Slide number, we have slide number five already? OK. Yeah, to finish slowly. I need to finish quickly. Uh, th th this is the GDP growth. Uh, so you can see it's uh, in Bulgaria in 1990. It's uh, negative numbers. Uh, Czechoslovakia, they're all negative numbers across all four of these countries. And now we go to slide number six, please. And this is uh, for um, Yugoslavia. And uh, here we can see 
that uh, the uh, national income annual growth rates uh, were between 1980 and uh, 1988 not uh, not functional. In fact, it was. Uh, there's only one year there was, uh, in all these years, there was a positive number, that was 1986, and the rest was either negative or an 84-0. Industrial output somewhat better, uh, but uh, again, you know, the, the, by 1988 it was shrinking. Uh, and uh, agricultural output, well, I guess it depends on the weather in part. Uh, so that, that, that was sort of problematic. Uh, in uh, in the late 80s, Yugoslavia had a poverty rate of 25%. In 1991, uh, before the breakup of the country, 15% uh, unemployed. So it, it seems that the communists failed not only to achieve their objectives in religious policy, but also failed in music policy and failed in economics. And they failed by their own standards this is not an external standard, it's by their own standards they failed. They failed to, to attain their stated objectives. Thank you for listening. Um, lepo pozdravljeni še z moje strani, hvala za povabilo na Retro Festival. Danes, zjutraj, ko sem se peljal proti Ljubljani in sem razmišljal o tem pogovoru, ki zdaj sledi, v katerem upam boste z vašimi vprašanji in komentarji sodelovali tudi vi, sem razmišljal, kaj loči Sabrino Petro Rame od drugih znanstvenikov in znanstvenic, ki se zgodovinskega, sociološkega, politološkega vidika ukvarjajo z vprašanjem um, Jugoslavije, vzhodne Evrope, političnega sistema, a vsem tem, o čemer je uh, Sabrina zdaj govorila v svojem predavanju in mislim, da je ključna razlika sledeča. Ko je Jugoslavia pokala po šivih, ko so politični sistemi po vzhodnej Evropi propadali, je to področje postalo izredno zanimivo za raziskovanje. Sem so prihajali sociologi, politologi, zgodovinari, pogosto iz bogatih ameriških univerz, tu delali intervjuje z domačini, znanstveniki, znanstvenicami, pogosto kakšno idejo bom rekel, kar direktno ukradli, objavili v svojih besedilih. Mi smo takrat večinoma objavljali še v lokalnih jezikih. Ampak Sabrina Petra Rame ni med njimi. Sabrina Petra Rame je ta prostor a, raziskovala že v 70-ih, naučila se je nekaj jezikov, ki jih govorimo tukaj in kot ste lahko slišali v današnji predstavitvi a, in lahko potrdim a, iz prve roke, pozna tudi precej, precejšen katalog a, jugoslovanske rok glasbe in to zna tudi za peti. So Sabrina, I was say, saying only nice things about you, uh, primarily the fact that you were researching this um, part of the world already in the 70s, much before it became very hip and modern and interesting when the communism was falling apart. I also mentioned the fact that you can sing a lot, a lot of rock songs from, from former Yugoslavia. I've heard you doing it, so do not I, deny I, it. I, I think you were stretching things. Okay. I learned a couple of languages, yeah, Serbian and Croatian. Well, okay. <laughs> now these are two, it used to be one. Um, in your, thank you very much for your uh, interesting lecture and from, for the elements of a concert which we uh, faced here. Um, but you presented in your lecture a very bleak image of what was going on. Uh, you mentioned that uh, communists failed economically, that the cultural reform uh, was not successful religiously, they were not successful in what they tried to achieve. Um, so on the basis of all these, one could say that all these very profound reforms which have changed the society here failed. But would you say that there were also some positive changes, some positive reforms, reforms in which the previous political system succeeded? So, and which um, would these reforms be and in what way? Okay, I, I, I would like to... Uh uh, first start with your idea, your, your um, is this microphone working? Um, your suggestion that uh, my portrayal of uh, the, the situation was bleak. Um, 
I wouldn't exactly put it that way. Uh, the communists failed in their objectives, uh, but that doesn't mean it was bleak. In fact, uh, some of the culture just, you know, music is always for me like number one. Um, uh, it, just in music, uh, there were some incredibly wonderful things composed uh, in uh, East Central Europe or Eastern Europe, take your pick. Uh, I mean, I, I often think back to, I mean, this is a little a little gem, but it's, uh, uh, how many of you know the song Patulzi? Flada Divlian. Uh, <laughs> Mitya knows it. <laughs> <laughs> Mitya knows not everything, but almost everything. Uh, okay, uh, so Patulzi, it's uh, Vlada Divlian and Sasha Shantorov, and uh, uh, they have they quote from hi ho hi ho it's home from work we go they quote from that disney song uh of course it's mostly their own music uh but they, they do that it is a delightful charming little song uh and uh, there are there are others i mean i i went to a Lachny Franz concert not the one at metalka but an indoor one uh, i went to the one at metalka too but uh uh, one of the ones with Metallica. Um, there was something dirty written on the sign. Somebody had explained it to me. You know, it's not nice. No. Uh, but uh, at the indoor concert, which I attended, uh, Lachny Franz played a rock waltz. Now, it's probably not... I don't know if I can think of another rock waltz. I, I certainly wouldn't say it's, it suggests that it's the only rock waltz ever composed. But it's the first one I heard. Uh, and uh, for me, you know, there, there are, as, as I used to tell my students, uh, there are, music can be divided into two broad categories. Waltzes and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> I would say good and bad, but okay. <laughs> Waltzes and everything else. Um, so, but there, there was a lot of great things coming out of culture. And not only that, but uh, precisely the repression uh, stimulated. There was a, 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 a Polish novelist called Tadeusz Konwitzki, uh, who was sort of stimulated uh, by the communists to go contrary uh, and, and wrote some very good work. And... Uh, it's human nature that when one is being pushed in a, in a certain direction, uh, intelligent people don't want, want to go that direction. They want to go, if anything, opposite. So there, there was certainly a lot of originality, wonderful cultural products coming out, not only in, in, in uh, not only in uh, the field of music, but also in, in painting. Uh, I looked at, at, at uh, some books about paintings. And by the way, it, it very in East Germany, very conformist until about the last year or two. Uh, and then uh, as the control slackened, uh, there was uh, the, the start of a lot of innovation, uh, abstract art, things that would have been could have cost painters their lives back in the end of the 40s uh, were now put on display. Uh, in the religious religious sector, um, I, I showed you on the chart how the, the communist policy resulted in, in more people believing in God. So I think from the standpoint of of, uh, of a, a priest, uh, a priest would I'm guessing only, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that a priest might say, well, it, it was ambivalent, bad for Christianity in some ways, but good in other ways. I can tell you the one way in which it was definitely bad for Christianity, and that was that knowledge about uh, the, the faith uh, was... Uh, which just uh, went uh, seriously down in, in, in most of the countries uh, of the region. Uh, it's said that, uh, this is a smaller side, but it's said that in Albania, people would hang a picture of Enver Hoxha on the wall, um, but uh, in the evening they would turn it around and behind they would have a picture of a saint. Huh? <laughs> or of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, positive things. Uh, Self-management got a lot of attention. I remember reading in the pages of Vyasnik uh, that uh, there were 
uh, there were teams of people or groups of people coming from China, from the United States, from West, from Germany, West Germany in those days, uh, probably other countries too, uh, to study, uh, to talk to people in, in these workers' councils and see what was going on. Uh, and certainly uh, the idea that uh, the resources of a country belong to the people and shouldn't be in the pockets of a few rich guys this is something with which I, I, I agree 100 percent, 100 percent. So you know that that is sort of pointing in a, in a direction. Uh, the uh, here I'm going to use the term socialists, uh, uh, thinking maybe perhaps about the, uh, the socialists in this area, League, League of Communists of Yugoslavia. Um, they were looking in a direction, uh, could see this uh, wonderland far off, very attractive. Uh, and if it could, it could have been obtained, well, could it have been approximated? Could we have gotten closer to it? Well, this is, of course, uh, the big question. Uh, can something be done later? There was, oh yes, uh, when East Germany was breaking up, there's a woman called Bärbel Böhle, I think that's the name. If, if it's, that, it's not the name, it's very close. Uh, and her idea was that East Germany uh, was no longer going to be the German Democratic Republic, uh, but was going to reconstitute itself as a socialist alternative to West Germany. Uh, but then the the, uh, the unification came quickly. But that tells you that she, like uh, she was considered a, a dissident, a free thinker, uh, but she saw some some merit in in uh, the socialist or socialist program, socialist or communist. Take your pick. Okay. If we can stay with religion for just um, a little bit more, maybe if you can go back to the first slide where um, we had data about the belief in God, and this data was taken in 2017. So it is after the change of the, the system, and your argument was that the communists didn't succeed because there is much higher belief in God in eastern part of Europe than western part of Europe. I did check for Slovenia, it's 46 percent, Estonia is 13 percent, and Baltic countries specifically, 13, and Baltic countries specifically are lower, so they kind of fit more to the Western uh, Europe ra rather than to the Eastern Europe. So my question would be, um, and my grandmother, by the way, also had a picture of Tito and Jesus Christ on TV set, and that was all always worked perfectly together. Um, side, but to side, or side to side, side to side, wow. the whole day. <laughs> Nothing changed in the evening. <laughs> uh, but uh, my question is: Would you say that, uh, or could you say that the pol previous political system is the only factor, the only reason which can explain these differences in the religiosity? Because it seems to me that there are other factors at play. Because Slovenia, Baltic countries um, are closer to Western Europe. And then when you look at Italy, Italy belongs to Eastern Europe in terms of the rate of how many people believe in God. Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, encourages people to pray uh, is difficulty. If somebody is really sick or has a sick uncle or sick aunt, uh, there's a strong temptation to pray. If one is living with a, a sick family member for extended periods of time uh, and one doesn't get any, any help from this wor world, it's very natural to hope that there's some help that can be obtained from another world. So th this is a, uh, certainly a, a very natural connection. Uh, that, doesn't, uh, that could only be uh, systemic, though, if other factors come into play. Uh, one of the factors which uh, uh, could come into play would be economics. And of course, there are some countries of Eastern Europe or East Central Europe which are not doing well at all uh, economically. The poorest in the region are uh, Moldova, Albania, and uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Bosnia-Herzegovina, you can see pretty high rate of, of religiosity. I think Hungary has gone down somewhat because Viktor Orban has been pushing it so much. Uh, so I think that's the explanation. But uh, poverty can be a factor, illness can be a factor, jobs can be a factor, 
uh, generational change, uh, generations can be a factor. Um, in Russia recently, the younger generation is going back to religion. So it doesn't, you know, we, 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 in the old days we would think, yeah, the older generation, the babushkas, they like religion, the younger people don't. Well, it's not so simple. In fact, it's the opposite now in Russia. Education can make a difference. So, you know, you look around university professors, for example, you won't find uh, uh, particularly high rates of religiosity, except, of course, at the Faculty of uh, Theology. <laughs> okay, one more question about religion. In your book, you talk about how some religious institutions, particularly in Poland and East Germany, were very active in opposing the communist regime, unlike churches in some other places. What are the consequences of their active role in opposing the previous political system now, particularly in terms of separation of church and state? What are the consequences of the opposition to communism now? Uh, actually, that's not the dominant factor. Um, uh, Albert Schoen here, the bishop whom I met uh, in 1988, uh, very impressive man, very, very impressive. He came up with this idea, church in socialism, uh, meaning that he wanted to be able to criticize, but he was, it was going to be, let's say, not antagonistic criticism, not destructive. And uh, uh, there, was a, there was a big meeting between him and Honecker in March of 1978. In September of 1978, so-called pre-military uh, education was introduced in the schools with young, young, uh, young children uh, being put into small tanks that were uh, maybe about uh, three times, four times the size of one of these chairs, so very small tanks, uh, but to get them used to the idea that they can ride around in a tank and say, fire one. Uh, and uh, uh, and Albrecht uh, was criticizing this. So we could say that uh, by uh, uh, engaging in this meeting with Honecker, he had set the stage for being able to criticize. There was also, uh, Honecker wanted Schoen here for something very special, and that was in 1983. Uh, there was going to be a, a celebration of Martin Luther, uh, 400 uh, years since his birth or something. Uh, no, uh, and that wouldn't have been right, uh, 450 or something. Um, the exact number of years since his birth is maybe not the highest point of interest here. The point is there was Martin Luther, Martin Luther year, uh, and there were plays commissioned, there were music commissioned, there were concerts, there were speeches, and uh, Honecker, of course, did not want this to be just a communist event. He wanted the church engaged. And so uh, so that he got the church engaged, and, and this was a kind of a, uh, a, a, he had to pay the price of, of putting up with uh, uh, Schoenherr's Kirche uh, im Sozialismus. Where, where I see a, a long-range effect, though, uh, is uh, somewhere else, uh, and that is that very soon after uh, communism crumbled, uh, there were revelations in uh, most of the countries in the region, not quite all, uh, but most of the countries in the region uh, about the collaboration of uh, bishops, archbishops, uh, archimandrites, patriarchs in the Orthodox Church uh, and ordinary priests and pastors with communists. Uh, and the, this uh, collaboration uh, typically took the form of passing along information, information about uh, fellow uh, clergy, information about uh, the congregations so that the communists uh, through the secret police would have some idea and the way the way it worked in practical terms would be let's say i'm a secret police agent uh, and you're a bishop and say your excellency would you like to get together with me and have a nice dinner in town i will get you some cognac and you, if you're stupid you say no if you're smart you say of course 
Of course. Okay. Where shall we go? You know, I, I, I think we have some common interests. I would like to ask you some questions. Is that okay? <laughs> I guess yes. What can you tell me? Will you tell me some things about the priests that you know about? <laughs> <laughs> okay, before this turns into a play, I have a question about gender. You mentioned uh, in your lecture at the beginning that um, in those books that you read or reread, including the book that you throw into the trash bin, there's nothing or not much about gender and gender equality. Now, this issue is becoming um, important again globally because of what's going on with uh, reproductive rights of women particularly, but gender equality as such has not been achieved yet. Um, in Yugoslavia, we have a history of something that is called state feminism. So there was, at least in the 80s, some kind of a collaboration between the new social movements, including the feminist movement and the state. And the heritage in terms of gender equality, I would say, is positive. So what is your take on the, heritage, the communist heritage of gender equality in Eastern Europe? The first article I ever published about Yugoslavia was called Women, Work and Self-Management. It was published in East European Quarterly in 1983. So alt bin ich doch. But at any rate, this, uh, uh, this article uh, reported how there was this one factory. Uh, and I gave other examples but uh, in the article. But there was one in particular uh, where something like 95% of the employees were women, but the director was a man. And this pattern was replicated uh, throughout uh, the, the factories. Uh, that it, was, it was typically a man, uh, e even if even if two thirds or more of the, of the employees uh, were female. So I would say that at that level, it didn't look so good. It is true that, that of course, that uh, in the socialist countries, did better with uh, with uh, achieving some. Uh, measure of gender equality when compared to countries like France, the United States, Great Britain. So that, that's granted up front. Uh, but you know, there, there are two ways to assess uh, how the communists did. One is, is by comparison with other countries, and the other is by comparison with, against their own standards, uh, and which is what I did in my lecture. I, I looked to, to what, what were they trying to do, uh, and what, what did they manage to do. Um, the, one of the things that I, I and I, I met with uh, with independent uh, feminists, uh, including the late uh, Lydia Sklevitsky, uh, among others, and the late uh, Jagana Papic, and others who are not not passed on. Um, uh, Jagana Papic, I, I might mention, is one of one of the two or three people who impressed me the greatest in my life. She was phenomenal, just absolutely phenomenal. Um, at any rate, I mean, such an intellect, uh, absolutely uh, dazzling. Uh, but um, what the communists said uh, was that uh, the communist policy was working toward gender equality. Independent feminists, by being independent, are in some ways against communist policy. By being against communist policy, they are de facto against gender equality. So independent feminists were de facto against gender equality. Now, they may not have put in exactly those words, but uh, that was the gist of it. OK, we have five more minutes time for one or two short questions from the audience. Yes, please. Um, you might have to write it down. Let's see. Thank you very much for your presentation. But I have some question. You present everything what is uh, with the communist uh, idea of control, to control the people. But what's happened con to how we control today people in liberal society? For example, I lived in Italy for 10 years, and I noticed that uh, television of Berlusconi with seduction. Politicians are very stony? Berlusconi. Berlusconi. Berlusconi, sorry. Berlusconi. He controlled the people through the entertainment, he constructs pleasure. People feel the pleasure. And this is one uh, way to how you can control the people in a more sophisticated way. 
that they feel fun, that they feel good. They don't, don't feel oppression. But because this means that the way to control the people in a modern liberal society is much more sophisticated than during the communism. This is my opinion. Another thing, you said about Bosnia and Herzegovina, I'm coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina, why people uh, have, believe in God. But you can be, to believe in God in some personal reason. But what we have to, uh, today in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have in all Eastern society, we have transition. What is transition? Transition is destruction of society, deep destruction of society from the something which we have, which could communists construct, and now what we have is deep dis destruction of society in every sense. This has been. That is, we start to divide the people, we start to destroy the factory, we, we in the name of the free market and society, destroyed every kind of the uh, social value, and we are living now in empty space. In this empty space, we, have, we need to have something. We need to have some belief. This is one of the reasons. This is not just because the communists are bad that they didn't construct something uh, successful. Because of the collapse of the society, people start to believe in something. OK, thank you very much for your question. Um. Okay. Well, I mean, there's three themes uh, in in your in your comment uh, about transition. Um, you have a, a way of thinking about it that's quite legitimate. Uh, looking at how uh, at least some of the, the political leaders in the region have thought about it. If and this is not not inconsistent with your point of view. It's just a different take, I think, on what you've said. They've thought about. The transition is going from one place to another, from being members of Comic-Con and the Warsaw Pact to coming into the European Union and NATO. And so uh, transition in, in, in certainly entails a notion that there's an end to the transition. And the end of the transition is entry into the European Union and NATO. Those countries that have gotten into both uh, in theory, of end of the transition doesn't mean the end of problems. I mean, just look at Hungary again under Viktor Orban. I mean, his country is in both of these these organizations, and yet his country is uh, uh, a mess. Uh, his politics is a mess. What did I do with my glasses? I'll put them away. Um, sorry about that. Uh, it's probably the work of some supernatural being. Um, so empty space, um, the suggestion that with the end of communism there, there are no values, uh, uh, that's a big statement. Uh, and uh, I will say I'm deeply skeptical, uh, quite apart from the fact that religious organizations have values, other people have values too. Uh, Anybody who considers him or herself a liberal uh, has the values of, of uh, rule of law, individual rights, tolerance, respect for the harm principle, equality, and neutrality of the state in matters of religion. These are values. These are not uh, completely absent in East Central Europe. There was in Poland for a while a political party called the Palikot Party named after Mr. Palikot. And he got, managed to get uh, a, a few people uh, in his party into the parliament. I don't think he has any representation now. But among other things, the Palikot party stood for something, stood for gender equality, stood for equality for sexual minorities. Anybody who's fighting for sexual minorities, uh, such as, uh, um, What's my friend's name in Macedonia? Slav, uh, uh, Slavcho uh, Todorov, isn't it? Dimitrov. Dimitrov. Slavcho Dimitrov. Uh, he, he's upholding values of equality for sexual minorities. So there are, are values. Uh, uh, and they're not imposed through politics. Now, uh, you are right, of course, in thinking that there can be values communicated through um, popular culture. Uh, there are values com uh, communicated through commercials. 
and I get so fed up and you know the, the commercials come you know even though I, I can speak Norwegian I, I can also block it out more easily than English so when I'm watching something on television a Norwegian commercial comes on I'm able to block it out and at the end of the commercial I've got no idea literally no idea what they were pushing and that makes me happy but they can't get 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 to me um, so uh, uh, I'm not. A, I, I don't. I can't talk about Italy. I mean, of course, I know a little bit about Berlusconi, uh, but uh, you know, not enough for me to say anything intelligent. Uh, the countries outside of uh, outside of Eastern Europe, the countries I know best, one way or the other, up to a point, different points, would be Germany, uh, Russia, uh, and the United States. Probably those and patches. I know something about the Spanish Civil War and about fascist Italy, but you know the, the Nazi Germany. But these are patches. Uh, what I can tell you about uh, the United States is that right now uh, there is a, a various, very serious contest going on. Uh, I think Kamala Harris will will win the election. Uh, the Democratic Party from my point of view, is a party that's working for the interests of, uh, let's say, many or most Americans. Uh, there's not much attention to the homeless, but certainly the homeless will do better under Kamala Harris by a long shot than under Trump. Uh, Trump uh, stands for one thing, Donald Trump. Uh, and that's it. Uh, and he's a, he's a sort of Robin Hood in reverse. He wants to cancel programs that people need in order to fatten up his bank account and the bank account of his rich buddies, uh, uh, some of whom are happy, happy to see that happen. Uh, some of the people who go out and cheer for him, MAGA crowd, these are people who are not thinking about values. They're not thinking about policies. They're not thinking about what will this man do do in in in, in office. What do they think about? They think about, oh, he's entertaining. He's fun to watch. Wouldn't it be nice to have him entertaining us from the White House for four years? That's really dangerous. And that's where I could say uh, I see a certain empty space. And let's stop here. We started on one side of the world, ended up on the other one. Only dogs and cats and eating migrants is uh, was missing in, in this. Story. We had a man asking a question here. Let's uh, have a woman have, asking a question over here. I'm sorry, we have to we have to wrap up because you're not um, going to let a woman speak. What is with the laws? Do. Uh, we did cover gender equality today in, in, in our debate. Uh, we have to wrap up, but there is still time to discuss privately uh, with Sabrina Petra Rame if you have any pressing questions or if you disagree or agree with what she said. Thank you very much, Sabrina, uh, for coming back to Ljubljana again, and good luck with the Christmas shopping. Thank you.